Good afternoon. Welcome to our work session, March 28th, 2023. Uh, I am calling this meeting to order. Notice is given of our option to recess into executive session. Notice is hereby given to the members of the City Council and to the general public that at this work session, the City Council may vote to go into executive session, which will not be open to the public for legal advice and discussion with the city's attorneys on any item listed on the following agenda. May we have roll call, please. Mayor Daggett. Here. Vice Mayor Aslan. Here. Councilmember Harris. Here. Councilmember House. Councilmember Matthews. Here. Councilmember McCarthy. Here. Councilmember Sweet. Here. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Sweet, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Councilmember Harris, will you read our mission statement? Yes, I will. Thank you. The mission of the City of Flagstaff is to protect and enhance the quality of life for all. Thank you. And Vice Mayor, our land acknowledgement. The Flagstaff City Council humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of this area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands, still inhabited by native descendants, border mountains sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will forever know this place as home. Thank you. Review of Jeff <clears throat> draft agenda for April 4th, 2023. Mayor, uh, public participation. Oop, I, just sorry you know. about that. Item number four, public participation, the most important part. And this it enables the public to address the council about items that are not on the prepared agenda. Each speaker has up to three minutes, and you may address council up to three times throughout the meeting. Do we have any public participation? Mayor, I have not received any cards. Thank you. Number five, review of draft agenda for the April 4th, 2023 City Council meeting. Do um, council members have any questions or comments about the draft agenda I take it that that is a no all right uh, item number six March work anniversaries I believe Shannon has this one yes thank you mayor I'll pull up the presentation Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, we have for you all of our work anniversaries uh, for March. And again, these are in five-year increments um, until we get to 20 years, um, 25 years, and then we do each year after that. Um, so for this month, our five-year anniversaries, uh, we have Gabrielle Tassini. Uh, she works in our recreation in our pros division. Also five years, we have Officer Holland, who works for our Flagstaff Police Department. Uh, we have Janice Hakala, who is one of our code compliance officers in community development. For our 10-year anniversaries, we have Brian Lutmer. He works in streets, which is part of our public works division, as well as Martin Westerland. He is one of our library pages um, in, again, our economic vitality uh, work group. That's all that we actually have for you for the month of March. Um, but we'll be back before you in April. Thank you so much, and congratulations to each of these uh, employees. It, it says a lot about an organization when you have uh, employees that have such longevity. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right, on to our city manager report. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Um, as we typically do, we'll go through a few highlights and then I'll turn it over to others. 
uh, to speak appended to this report, uh, and I won't touch on it uh, unless you have questions, but uh, the High Country Humane uh, Stats Report for February. Uh, and then uh, we also will have our PROS March newsletter. I might ask Amy Hagan to come on down in preparation for that presentation. Uh, if she can come down to the podium, we, um, I think we're going to uh, deviate from protocol here and recognize a few parks employees who uh, hopefully are with us this afternoon. You'll see in my very first paragraph a little blurb about uh, some heroics and I was wondering if Amy could come down and share with you this incredible story, uh, and then we could recognize these three individuals. Thanks. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Amy Hagan, Assistant Parks and Recreation Director. Um, I didn't know, do we want anything displayed on the screen? You, City you know, I will go ahead. I have a narrative, and I okay. will read it, and then maybe you can introduce your colleagues. You got it. We'll do a little tag team. Okay. Um, this uh, hot off the press, um, three parks employees, Juan Avitia Herrera, yes, oh. Ian Anderson and Anthony Milligan, uh, worked diligently and expeditiously to <coughs> contact Flagstaff PD and remove a pickup truck that was stuck on the railroad tracks. Uh, this occurred recently. They were uh, able to use a front and loader, a loader to successfully remove the vehicle from the tracks. BNSF shared with us uh, that the, had the call been five minutes later, they would not have been able to stop the train. So uh, amazing heroics and these three guys are with us. Can we have them come down? These three gentlemen are with us. Are you willing to come down? We have Anthony, Ian, and Juan with us. They're actually all three parks technicians within the park section. and. This was in the wee hours of the morning of that last large storm around the 1st of March, and their actions were simply amazing. That occurred that morning and their reaction to everything. Um, we have processed a WOW award for all three of them, and that is a part, just only a part of our gratitude to their quick thinking and their actions taken that day. Congratulations, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Amy, thank and we you. will put you on the spot here in a little while, so, but thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, for uh, letting us deviate there. On to other uh, department updates. Um, when he's not running the care unit, Captain Feltz is also able to operate equipment and remove large amounts of snow, which he's been doing from several fire stations uh, in recent times with the use of streets heavy equipment. want to give Props to Captain Feltz for his many talents. <clears throat> On the subject of the care unit, uh, we note that the team was able to help out a resident living at the Chesh in Cheshire to get medication from North Country during the significant snowstorms that occurred uh, recently. So uh, big props to the care unit. Moving on down, um, also in the category of uh, recognizing heroics, uh, officers, Bethany Hyde, Kevin Callahan, and Andre Kyles, I hope I got that right, uh, responded to a call for a person who needed assistance. Um, they were able to gain entry into the home, check on the person, uh, found her uh, barely breathing and non-responsive, and uh, took the necessary measures to uh, successfully uh, bring her back. Uh, and so thank you officers for saving a life. Um, on to Public Works, we note that the facilities maintenance uh, team has been engaged, uh, this is in no surprise, uh, of no surprise, but engaged in a lot of roof and gutter repairs and uh, roof repairs uh, with the recent snow, ice, and subsequent melt-off, including right here in City Hall, our human resources team was able to uh, uh, return to their offices today and tomorrow after uh, having had some significant uh, roof repairs, which I think has been a common narrative throughout the community uh, with all the recent weather. Moving on to water services, uh, also I guess in the category of recent weather, um, we of course have been spilling at Lake Mary. Uh, that's been happening for some time. 
And with uh, recent uh, high ponding and, and tributary flows over the last few weeks, influ influent flows to uh, our Wildcat uh, Hill water uh, facility has been between nine and a half and 12 million gallons per day. Um, to put that into context, uh, we typically see much less than half of that. And, uh, but we're maintaining our monthly average, we'll be watching that, uh, but things are rocking and rolling at the Wildcat facility. I took the liberty of excerpting into my report the flag in flight report, which I find to be a very good read and some nice photographs uh, as well. I will not go through all the wonderful articles there, but would invite you to give it uh, a, a read at your leisure. There's a lot of good updates in that, including the parking lot project, which is getting underway, uh, some logging operations near the airport, and uh, not the least of which in terms of significance is our farewell to Barney Helmick. After 12 plus years of service with the airport, he uh, hopes to retire. Uh, we're doing our best to uh, send him off in, in a good fashion, but uh, we, of course, are reluctant to see him go at all, but um, he'll be celebrating his retirement next month. We wish him the best. Uh, a couple of nice photos to share with you, and then just some updates on some meetings. Uh, I think you have heard this already, but we had a very nice meeting with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, last week, Friday, March 17th. Thank you, Mayor, for attending. Thank you, Council Members McCarthy and Matthews for also attending. Nice photo of our Mayor with Colonel Julie Balton uh, to enjoy. It was a productive meeting. Uh, we hosted upstairs, went for a couple of hours, and it was all very productive. Um, with that, I think I will, uh, oh, I will take note. Uh, it is, when I mentioned it in the report, it was an announcement of something yet to occur, but now it's in our rear view mirror. We, we had an open house last night here, council chambers, uh, on the short-term rental ordinance and license. It was a, a very uh, full house, both uh, in person and remote. A um, lot of uh, good presentations and questions, and uh, we will continue with this public outreach and discussion as we move toward short-term rental policy. Thank you to Sarah Langley and many others for helping to orchestrate that meeting. Um, it was good. So with that, uh, I will turn it back to Amy Hagen to walk you through the pros updates. Actually, Greg, it's going to be me. Amy is going to assist me uh, in case I can't finish speaking. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. Uh, yes, we can. We're glad to have either of you or both of you. I was just assuming that maybe uh, it would be Amy, but it's a pleasure to have you speak to us. Thank you, Greg. Uh, can you please confirm that you can see the report on the screen? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so um, Mayor and Council, thank you for having us this afternoon. My name is Rebecca Sayers. I'm the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Events Division Director. We uh, want to start out our report this month welcoming some team, new team members. And this is super exciting because the majority of these are parks maintenance workers. This is a position that's been very difficult to fill and we are getting close, we hope, to being fully staffed. So please help us welcome Bryson Brown, Derek O'Daniel, and Brandon Prieto as our new parks maintenance workers. We also have an intern working at, with us right now from NAU. Um, Tobin is, uh, has been working with the team since January. And then we have a promotion of sorts within the recreation team we had a temporary staff member, Audrey Kerson, uh, applied for and successfully was able to um, be offered the position of aquatics coordinator in our Aquaplex. So it's super nice to have that promotion. And she just started that position last week. I'm scrolling down a little bit here. I'm gonna try to go one page at a time without making anybody sick. 
Uh, the trail counters are still active, as you can see here. We have a few that were out of commission due to snow and such, but you can see um, that our trails are still very active even in winter. And this is a report that our commission is super interested in seeing uh, each month. We couldn't talk about February and March without talking about snow um, and have a picture of someone doing something with snow. So um, we wanted to report that in February, uh, the accumulation so far of 33 inches was important. We spent over 1400 hours in um, snow removal and relocation <clears throat> last month. Um, so kudos to our teams that are out there working hard every snowstorm. Uh, we recently hosted some training out at the Aquaplex. You can see in this photo, um, these are our new screens that hopefully um, are better than the old one as um, council may, be, may remember. And we look forward to welcoming the council out there hopefully for the April budget retreat. But this training was a great partnership um, with our state Parks and Recreation Association. We also took advantage of spring break to host some uh, different kinds of activities than what we normally do at Hal Jensen. They took several field trips and did uh, different kinds of arts and crafts. Uh, we had a special St. Patrick's Day skate at Jay Lively. You can see here, if you wore green, you got in for free. So that was kind of fun. Um, and then at, over at uh, the Josie Montoya Center, We've uh, got our new cohort of NAU nursing students that have started working with us. Uh, they come in just about every semester um, to learn how to work with this demographic as part of their studies. So great partnership there. Moving on to open spaces um, over uh, President's Day weekend, we had a group of uh, teenage volunteers from um, from Pennsylvania, and we were planning on having them do some work out at Picture Canyon, but because of snow, they couldn't. So we had them remove snow around um, the Thorpe Park Annex garage. And uh, this is the area where Open Space stores a lot of their materials. Of course, I think the next weekend it got reburied again, but it was still fun to see them out there. Um, and then these are a couple of pictures of Picture Canyon which is certainly seeing the water flow. Um, and as I understand it, that bridge recently was underwater. So that's how much water we've got flowing through there. On the events and marketing side, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna make it, I promise. We have uh, some partnerships that uh, we're working on for activities this summer that we're super excited about, including with the Downtown Business Alliance and Coconino County Parks and Rec. Uh, hopefully you will, you, not hopefully, but you will hear more about those soon. Um, we're working on our branding and uh, social media marketing. So please um, give us any feedback as, as you're seeing these things on our uh, social media pages. And then something that was exciting, we were able to recently announce to our event partners. These are the folks in the community uh, and outside the community that permit through us uh, a city property to host an event. And uh, through ARPA funding over the last couple of years, we've been able to fund a lot of event related fees, such as rental fees, electricity, things like that. Um, and because of that funding, source, not that the funding source has increased, but we haven't had as many take advantage of that as we planned on in the first couple of years. So we've been able to extend that it going into this summer as well, which was uh, welcome news at an event partners meeting uh, just last week. So that is our report. I made it. I'm happy to try to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Do we have any questions? Or comments all right that is it and um, oh excuse me councilmember Harris can you just tell me how you determine who uh, how many people uses uh, use the trails is there something at the head of the trail where they 
have to take something or they count something or they report to you or whatever? Excellent question. So we have there a trail counter device. They're somewhat hidden, but not for any inconspicuous reason. They're in a two inch by two inch steel tubing that's very similar to our urban trail type railing, if you've ever seen that, more of the, the brown rusticated look. So they're inside of that with a, a counter and it goes all the way across the trail. So whether if you're on foot or in a bicycle, it's you're going to receive a count. Um, so we have them at specific locations uh, that, that are, and we have done that with some reason. One of them, our most popular trail is Buffalo Park, the entire loop. So we put one of those trail counters at about the mile and a quarter marker to see is it are most individuals doing the entire loop or are they cutting through the middle or what, what do we have here kind of thing. So they are in very specific locations to attempt to get those counts. But I do think it's key to understand that it's not only if you're on foot or if you're pushing a stroller or if you're on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. And city manager has a comment. Yeah, and this will conclude my report. And thank you so much um, for giving us an audience on all these topics. I also wanted to make mention, because I failed to mention it before, but many people were involved in the short-term rental uh, discussion last night, and uh, Anya Wendell and uh, Reggie uh, Eccleston uh, amongst the, the team who helped answer a lot of questions and put things together. So for all who were involved in that, we're greatly appreciative. And thank you, Mayor. That concludes my report. All right, thank you. No additional questions or comments on either report? All right, we move on to item number eight, post wildfire flooding update. Welcome, Ed. Good afternoon, apologies for having to walk all the way down here. It's a little late. Uh, Ed Shank, Stormwater Manager. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Uh, this will be our monthly update on the post wildfire update if it ever loads. I figure if I just hit it three times, I'm sure nothing bad will happen. All right, so we have the, the usual team here, uh, some of us at least, uh, today to go over some of the updates uh, for this month. Uh, just a quick uh, set of objectives. We'll go over the spruce wash updates for the museum fire, uh, the Schultz Creek updates for Pipeline West fire or Pipeline fire. Uh, a little bit of discussion on the spring flood mitigation planning and update. Um, brief discussion on snowmelt impacts to flooding. Uh, and then obviously plenty of time for discussion and questions. Uh, again, overall map, uh, to keep this very short, you can see the footprint for both the 2022 pipeline fire and the 2019 museum fire. Those are the two ones we are talking about today. Obviously, there are other fires, the tunnel, haywire as well, that are outside of the city boundary. For spruce wash, um, we do have that hyd new hydrology and flood modeling that does indicate that we still have an elevated flood risk uh, for both Grandview and Sunnyside. Uh, with that in mind, we are still moving forward with those bond projects. That's a Proposition 441 uh, that are in design. Um, we do have pretty good progress. We're getting to about 30% designs for most of those projects, and those will be expected in May. Uh, we do have that technical advisory committee that meets weekly, and then also focus groups for specific projects as needed. Uh, next one up, I believe, if I hope Max here. Mac, are you online? All right, well, I'll run it for Mac. Um, we do have those seven projects that are in design uh, going from upstream to downstream. That is the reconstruction of Grandview Avenue. Uh, ah, excellent. I'll let someone a little bit more knowledgeable than me speak. That's always a great idea. Uh, Mac, you want to take the next, next few? Thanks. Uh, sorry I'm late there. I was catching up with a couple other things. Um, I'm Mac McNamara. I'm a capital improvements project manager. I think Ed started this slide off here. Um, this is not a new slide, something we've brought to council before. Um, on the right is a context map for the seven projects we've identified. Um, we've got two channel improvements projects, two conveyance structures that will be upsized, a detention basin, um, <clears throat> Grandview roadway improvements, 
and we plan to construct a permanent, permanent inlet structure at Arroyo Seco. Um, <clears throat> so the next slide covers uh, project delivery and some of our consultants we have on board. Uh, we're delivering these projects through a CMAR, which we've discussed before. Um, that's also known as a CMAR. So a CMAR has been selected through a qualification-based process. We are working through negotiations right now on a design services contract. Um, our CMAR will retain a public relations firm to help with communications. We retain four separate design consultants for the suite of projects. And we have a survey consultant, a geotech consultant right now in the field um, working to support design for all seven projects. Uh, the next slide I have here is for a project delivery schedule. Um, this is somewhat ambitious, but we think it's still, we think it's feasible. Um, we plan to bring GMP number one to council on July 3rd. Uh, this will be for utility relocates in Grandview. Um, and we'll most likely start this in monsoons. Uh, final plans for all the projects will be completed by December 23rd this year. And we plan to bring GMT, GMP number two in February of 2024. This could have the remaining six projects. We're still trying to figure that out. Um, construction for those remaining six projects would start in the spring of 2024 and would continue through the fall of 2025. Um, we're thinking three projects would be in 2024 and three others would probably be in 2025. And that's... That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Sam Beckett, Section Director, Public Works. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the parkway basins that are uh, in the process of construction at this point. It is a county-led project. As we're trying to get all these different projects done, there's just no way we can get everything accomplished from one entity. So teamwork has been key in this. As we'll go through the, the quick bullet points here, the county project has been awarded to their contractor. We'll allow them to uh, make those announcements. Uh, construction equipment will be in the area. So if you're working up Paradise, Parkway is on the right-hand side. Uh, we will see some equipment in that area. They'll also be accessing the channel from the very end of Paradise. So uh, just one of those kind of heads up for the community to watch for that as it comes into place. There is utility uh, relocates and tree work it has begun because this process is moving rapidly as we'll get to this last bullet here and that'll kind of explain why. There is still in process the city county intergovernmental agreement for maintenance and operations in, uh, in the development of this. Still a lot of pieces to be worked out but we knew the project had to kick off. The funds have to be expended by the 30th of June so a lot of pieces are kind of just moving uh, very fluidly as we work through this process here. And then uh, the County Flood Control District will be providing all the direct communications and updates to the residents in there as it's their project, they're leading the effort, and we don't want to mix up any, uh, any information as it goes out to the group. And the last piece, the most important piece and why this project is moving so quickly is the uh, National Natural Resources Conservation Service funding has to be expended by the 30th. And that's why this project is kicking off and it's moving so rapidly. Uh, we're excited to have it done. We're hoping to get it done before the monsoons move in. But uh, it's just one of those pieces that teamwork is uh, how we're going to get it accomplished. So, and I'll kick this over. I think it's back to Ed. Thank you all. Okay, so now we're going to move over to Schultz Creek, so the west side. Um, let's see here. So the uh, detention basins that we did complete this fall, uh, they've seen some use actually this month. Uh, quite a bit of water going in them from that snow melt, a uh, little bit of rain on snow that we had. So good to see those basins operating as they should. Um, we also have that uh, project, so the, the um, sorry, the Schultz Creek Channel Stabilization Project between the basins and Highway 180. We'll go into a little bit of detail on that. Uh, the Highway 180 crossing, uh, we're past the 30% design, um, working with the Technical Advisory Committee uh, we do have one of the designers here today. If there's any questions, we'll talk a little bit on that. And then also Francis Short Pond dredging. 
so for the Schultz Creek Channel, there are two projects. We mentioned this before. Uh, just to give a quick update, uh, we did receive, or we are receiving the Emergency Watershed Protection EWP funding, so it's that, that, that Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS funding, very similar to what the county has for the Parkway Basin. Uh, that is funded at a little over $630,000 plus $49,000 for technical assistance. That would be design assistance. Uh, we'll meet that city match, which is a 25% match, uh, either through the stormwater rate or through uh, DFFM if we're able to get uh, that eligible for state reimbursement. Uh, that is moving very quickly. We're moving through design right now. We need to, uh, like the other project, like the Parkway Basins, we need to move rather quickly. Uh, we have until October 15th to complete that project. So moving quickly through design as well as property acquisitions, which I think you'll hear about uh, next meeting, next work session. Uh, the county project, Elden Lookout Road, that's also moving through design. Uh, they're very close to 90% design. They have their uh, construction service uh, firm as well on board, on board there's Banneke. Uh, they should be doing construction, I, I would assume, this summer, if not fall, uh, moving quickly on those. Both projects are important because they're designed to reduce the sediment and downstream debris impacts in Coconino States uh, and the rest of the city. So really, these two working in concert uh, really should reduce some of those sediment impacts that we'll see as the water moves through the basins and then down towards Highway 180. Uh, Schultz Creek at Highway 180, um, moving quickly towards that 60% design. Um, so a lot moving on there. Uh, also, no adverse impact analysis is going on as well. So we should hope to, hope to have both completed um, by June. So that would be 100% designs. Um, the no adverse impact is a little bit um, tricky just due to the fact that we're working not just with Schultz Creek but also the regional floodway of the Rio de Flag. So we do have to work through uh, that FEMA special flood hazard area. So working through the design on that with uh, the understanding that we also have to get the model correct. Um, funding obviously is an ongoing challenge. Uh, the hope is to avoid federalization of this project. So the hope to avoid federal dollars if possible as that would drastically uh, delay the projects uh, due to compliance and regulatory environment of uh, federal uh, projects. Uh, property acquisition discussion is still ongoing. We're talking both both the Mount Calvary Lutheran uh, School and Church as well as Museum of Northern Arizona. Uh, good, good progress with both of that. Uh, like I mentioned, you'll be hearing from Bryce next week about property acquisition for this project. Uh, there is a little bit of an issue with a restrictive covenant on the M&A property, the Museum of Northern Arizona. They have uh, what they call a nature preserve on that, uh, so that we'll have to work through that uh, covenant restriction uh, moving forward. Uh, French is short pond dredging. Uh, kind of same story as we had last month, unfortunately. Uh, it's still on, on hold due to the snowpack and the current condition. So we do have an overflow condition at French is short pond, even with the drain fully open. Uh, just due to the amount of water that we're seeing come through with that snow melt. So uh, last I checked about 15 minutes ago, we're um, about uh, 0.3 feet of overflow on that spillway, a picture of it right here. Um, so still moving water through there. Once we get that water a little bit lower, we can get some of our JOCs to come in, take a look, uh, to give us a bid for that dredge project. But obviously uh, a little bit slow, but we will get there with that, and we'll continue to assess the situation as we move forward. Uh, spring runoff, so uh, kind of changing topics slightly away from, um, you know, our typical post-wildfire flood update to, to typical spring, if you will. Uh, Snowmelt runoff, uh, obviously rather large snowpack we have up there. Um, you know, as of like last week, it was about 32 inches of snow water equivalent, so that's the equivalent liquid amount of water up on the peaks uh, in Snowslide Canyon based on the Snowtel site. Uh, so quite a bit of water, and that's uh, slowly melting off. Thankfully, it's mostly slow. Uh, stormwater continues to monitor our stream gauges as well as the NWS um, uh, predict predictive modeling, so the National Weather Service. And uh, we, we react as needed with public works, pros, others, uh, as we see issues out there. So obviously, you know, you've seen in the news or heard, you know, some of those low water crossings in other areas that have seen some high water. So uh, as to date, uh, we've been pretty lucky. It's been way better than some years, like 1993. Uh, the flood impacts have been fairly moderate at a community, le community level, um, but there is continued um, somewhat small threat of rain on snow events. 
Uh, and there have been some properties that have been damaged, unfortunately, due to um, some of this uh, high water. Uh, on the good news front, Upper Lake Mary is full, as you probably know, and flowing very uh, robustly down into Lower Lake Mary. Um, and there is water in Walnut Canyon below that. Uh, just some pictures to go with it. This is Fox Glen Park, uh, March 22nd of this year. Uh, obviously, pretty high water coming through from the Rio de Flag. And then another photo, uh, this is from March 19th. This is uh, Schultz Creek, actually, going into that uppermost basin. So just showing those basins working. You can kind of see the braided nature of the stream. That means it's dropping off sediment, it's dropping off debris. So uh, sediment and debris that we normally see down at Francis Short Pond or in the community uh, is being retained up there in those basins. So they're doing a great job so far this spring. Great to see them being used um, so quickly after construction. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it back over. I believe Sam's going to take the, the last slide and kind of a whirlwind tour here today. Yes, Councilmember Matthews has a question. Thank you, Mayor. Ed, um, I was reading some comments, you know, on social media and stuff about some sewer issues with Fox Glen and that flooding. Can you speak on that? Uh, yeah, I can speak a little bit to it. Um, obviously, we have our sewer collections group as well as our wastewater folks that uh, probably be better to identify the issues in a little more detail than I can. Uh, so what we have with a lot of these older sewer mains is a lot of them go in the channels, in the washes, and we have what's called I and I. So that's uh, infiltration and, I always miss the other I, inflow, yes, thank you. Um, so, so what happens is when you have a, a little crack in the concrete casing or you have a hole in uh, the top of a manhole, you're going to have some of that I and I. So you'll have some of that flow come down. And we're seeing that all throughout the city. Now, Fox Glen being a rather low area, like any sort of sump condition, that's where you're going to see a backflow. So you get enough of that water to come down very quickly, especially on the rain and snow events. And you may see uh, an area where you'll actually have a little bit of backflow from the sewer uh, into the surface system. So obviously not ideal. It's something that's definitely being addressed by our wastewater collections group. Um, They've been working on that for the last week and also monitoring other areas. So we are working on uh, making sure that that uh, backflow is, is not continuing and then also doing water quality testing to make sure that there's uh, not an issue with E. coli or anything else to the public. And I was just going to ask you about the health concerns. So besides just the contamination of the water, just people out walking their dog or strolling around and, and maybe not being aware that there's this contamination. Is that a concern at all at this point? We're monitoring it. I don't have an exact uh, water quality report for that. That would probably be a question for wastewater collections. Uh, I mean, one of the, um, the good news, if you will, is, is the amount of surface water, just storm water that's coming through, does tend to flush it pretty quickly. So the amount of wastewater compared to the amount of typical surface water, snow melt, um, is very small. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. All right. Well, believe it or not, I know there's snow on the ground, but spring is just around the corner, so we're told, um, unless you're around here this Wednesday or Thursday, uh, you may think otherwise. Short-term mitigations are definitely a topic that we discussed. Even today, um, Ed led a meeting to, uh, to start scoping out what that looks like this year as we go into um, potential monsoon season here this year we'll see what the weather brings us but really trying to figure out what do we need um, I think on the plus side uh, there was a lot of activity last year in people ensuring that their mitigations were in good shape I think that happened throughout the entire season with the intensity of monsoon that we saw and what we're seeing now is uh, most of those mitigations are still intact they're holding up they're in um, honestly a pretty good location for most of them and uh, there's a few areas where people have opened up walkways, things like that, that they'll have to close up this year. But we don't see a massive um, operation this year in the spring to get all these homes mitigated because everything is in a pretty stable condition at this point. So we'll continue to work through that as the snow melts. We're going to go out and evaluate and make sure that everything seems to be uh, where it needs to be. And uh, we'll also be distributing the new modeling. It'll be coming out through Ed. Uh, as that's ready for the group. The flood alert thresholds uh, will be evaluated. They are every year. It's just one of those pieces we do as a due diligence uh, to ensure that the flood modeling and the flood alerts align and that uh, we're given enough time and notice 
dependent on what the modeling is telling us. So those pieces are coming up. Uh, it's one of those things we do every year just to ensure that those stay accurate. Some of the big items that we're looking at this year, if needed, um, will be some of the pieces that uh, stormwater is really going to be supporting this year as their stormwater rates come into play here is the sandbag purchases, the barrier purchases. We've even got some new barrier coming in to try and help out. Um, the engineering assessments, uh, individual assistance for elderly and disabled, that's always one of those pieces we want to leave on the table. And then the, uh, the one thing here is that number that we've established a couple years ago is going to continue on with the uh, 213 2102. As we get into spring, we'll start collecting those calls. We'll have a smaller, I don't want to call it a call center. I hate using call center unless we're in a disaster situation, but we'll call it a service line. And as that's, those needs arise, uh, you can call that service line. We'll get you set up with an engineer or whoever it might be to come out to do those individual home assessments and help you understand what your risk may or may not be uh, in your particular area. But these are the big ticket items that we're looking at right now from a mitigation standpoint. I have a quick question. Yeah. <clears throat> will we be engaging volunteers again, do you think? We sure will. And are we contracting with United Way? I hope so. Yeah, I think that's the plan. Steve Thompson is uh, the volunteer coordinator for the city. He was in our meeting this morning and uh, truly an extraordinary person. And he'll definitely help coordinate all those, those items as they come up. Um, we haven't started to schedule. We haven't started scheduling those yet, uh, honestly, because we're not seeing that massive need. If we start seeing a huge influx of needs and wants from the community, then we'll start looking at what that might take to ramp up some of those volunteer efforts. But definitely uh, in the forefront of our minds right now. Thank you. Yeah. If nothing else, I'll give it back over to Ed to close out the show. That's an easy slide. Uh, if there's any extra questions, uh, we got a team here today, not just uh, the people who I've spoken, but we do have our designer and a few others as well. Um, so happy to take any questions, discussion, comments, etc. cetera. Um, we're here. Thank you. And I know we will have um, some questions. I'm wondering whether Shannon can give the answer to the uh, question regarding Fox Glen. Is Shannon on? Shannon might be able to join us, but I think Lisa Deem uh, is also available. I see uh, that she's in the chat. And Lisa, if you want to speak to this, that would be great. I don't think most of the bonds. Yes, good afternoon. Um, we were notified of the SSO, the sewer overflow, um, on Monday. And immediately, uh, parks closed off the affected areas. There, or well, actually, it was last week. Um, and there, there's signage at the site. Uh, there's been social media posts and the park is closed or the areas that are affected are closed so no one can accidentally walk their dog unless they go past all the tape and the closure signs um, that, are, that are in place at the park. As we speak, they are mitigating that, cleaning that up and um, it should be open soon. I don't know the date when. Um, it depends on when the new material, they have to actually replace the, the material, the name of the wood chips and the, the, the padding, especially at the playground. So I don't have a date or a time yet that that'll be open, but I do know that they are actively mitigating it now. Thank you, Lisa. And I see Council Member Matthews has a question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and it's not for Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Ed, uh, you said that there was um, one of our planners or designers about the 180 design. Can he come down or she come down and just speak a little bit more about what that looks like and how that's flowing? Yeah, definitely. So I'll have uh, Kayla Fleischman from SWI Ardura, and she can take some questions or comments. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, as Ed said, my name is Kayla. I work for SWI Ardura. Um, is there a particular question that you have, Council Member Matthews, regarding the Highway 180 project? Uh, just basic con concept of what the design is starting to look like and what you're working on. Sure. Um, so I'll start upstream. Um, so just to the east of Highway 180, um, near the American Conservation Experience, um, 
we are going to reroute a portion of um, Schultz Creek to go to the northwest um, instead of routing through the existing stormwater infrastructure under um, ADOT's right-of-way. Um, it'll go to the northwest um, and then it will direct across ADOT's right-of-way on a uh, by way of a box culvert um, or an arch culvert. Um, that's yet to be determined. Um, and it will flow through that conveyance structure, through the Mount Calvary Lutheran Church property and discharge at the Rio de Flag. Um, and there will be uh, armoring to the channel on both ends of that new box culvert infrastructure. You're welcome. What does armoring mean? Sure, um, so armoring can look like a lot of different things. Um, it could be a shot creek channel. Um, it could be a gabion mattress, um, which is a like a steel cage with a riprap, rock riprap inside. Um, and it, it could be grouted riprap. There's a couple different options that we're evaluating. And the purpose of that is to further detain any debris? Yeah, the purpose of that um, is to prevent scour of the channel. Okay, thank you. Um, the current culvert that we have now is downstream, obviously, that we all have gone out and witnessed. Um, and some of the comments that I've heard um, from a lot of the residents there is that um, the size was one of the issues. So is this new culvert design um, designed for potential 500 year flood events and other things that are a magnitude that maybe we haven't seen yet before, but can handle any of those? Sure. Um, Council Member Matthews, the, the thought there is that we are designing to a particular storm event. Um, we cannot design to the 500 year. Um, as you noted, um, that flow is far too large. The infrastructure would be far too expensive um, and far too large to fit. Um, but we are evaluating what that design storm is um, that we're mitigating to, and it's all based off um, J.E. Fuller's modeling efforts um, in the post-wildfire condition for the Pipeline West. Thank you. Other questions? I have a couple. Uh, Ed, I believe, do you know when um, we're going to have the modeling for the... Um, Schultz watershed? Yeah, great question. So we do have a preliminary model from J.E. Fuller for the Schultz Creek watershed, and that was something we talked about at a great length today, actually, in our short-term mitigation meeting. Um, so we do have the preliminary maps. Uh, our concern with pre publicly presenting those is you have to remember the difference between the map that we provided last year for the sandbags and the barriers which is uh, assuming there's no basins, and the model we have now, which has those Schultz Creek basins. Um, the, obviously, the difference is the basins. What we are concerned with is that we have a series of flood events that are similar to 2021, where uh, for Spruce Wash, we had three flood events within five days, um, or a type of event that we saw in 2022, but not here in the city on the county side. So on the county side, Wapaki Trails, some of those other watersheds um, saw multiple back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back flood events. So you saw one, you saw another, you saw another. So our concern with sharing the, the new model results is, again, the model is not predictive. The model just shows you what you put into it. So what we're putting into it is a two-inch and 45-minute storm one time for those basins. So that... We can show that, and we can show that to the public, and we can show that to everybody. We don't want to mitigate to that, though, because the, the problem that we can have, and we likely will have, because we saw it in 2021 in Spruce, we saw it last year on the east side, is let's say you have a storm, and that first storm, it goes exactly toward the model. You have your basins empty. They fill. You don't have any flooding downstream, or you have very little in some areas. You have the moderate in others. And then it starts draining, but it takes 36 to 48 hours for that to drain. So it starts draining, and you have another storm the next day, and it's not drained. Well, then you're going to have that same flood event that we are showing from last year 
with those flood models. So we're very concerned with showing a model that we think might be overly optimistic if you have back-to-back -back events. So we do not, do not really want to share a model that says, okay, yeah, the flood threat is a lot lower for parts of Coconino states. In other areas, it's still the same. And then you have a flood that's the same as what we were showing last year, if that makes sense. So we were concerned about being overly optimistic um, with a flood model like that. Really what, what's going to make a big difference is that Highway 180 culvert. Once we have that in place, um, that is the true flood mitigation, our end flood mitigation for Stavano Way, for Coconino Estates, um, for the downtown areas. Um, right now with those basins, just the basins by themselves, we're at an incomplete kind of temporary condition. So there is some concern from the, the larger group uh, that sharing the flood model, the new flood model, uh, might be giving too much of an optimistic uh, opinion if we have those back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back flood events, which would really mirror what we already have out there in the public for last year, if that makes sense. So what would be involved to um, create two models, to create one at the two-inch and then to create another one showing uh, an event coming right after that? Well, you have that. That's the, that's the model from last year. So the model from last year would be the same if we had two back-to-back -back events. That would look exactly like what we are showing for last year. So that's why we, as a group, we've, we're really thinking that the model from last year is the model that we still show um, for short-term mitigations, and that's what we recommend. Again, short-term mitigations are not required. This is just our recommendation to the community. So if people want to mitigate to a different level, if they want to mitigate down or up, um, that is obviously their prerogative. Um, but our, our professional advice is that we mitigate to that J.E. Fuller two-inch model from 2022. We do think that is the, the most realistic and um, most practical, pragmatic model. Uh, and in most cases, most houses are already mitigated to that based on uh, the work last year. So just to confirm, the model from last year includes the detention basins upstream? No, no, so to be clear, the, the model from last year does not include the detention basins. Why I say it's the same model if you have back-to-back -back is if you have back-to-back -back storms, you have to assume those detention basins are overwhelmed. So essentially you're taking them back off the table. Uh, so we'd have that same flood type as what we show without detention basins, so that makes sense. And, and I think th these are great questions, and this is why we're a little concerned about sharing two different models, is I think it gets very confusing very quickly to people. They see two different things and they're like, well, which one's right? And really what we're saying is either one can be right. It depends on the types of storms we see. It depends on type of weather we see, the soil conditions. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, so really to be pragmatic and to also to be um, as concerned with life and safety as we can, we really do think that the 2022 model, which is the model that is currently out in public and currently mitigated to, is the model to, to design for until the Highway 180 culvert is put in. Once that's in, then we can, we can really, with some confidence, come back here um, with yet a new model <laughs> that will really show a very enhanced uh, flood mitigation. But our real concern here is that we show something too optimistic. We do have back-to-back -back storms, which we've seen a lot of in these last couple of years, uh, and then uh, people are caught off guard. That's what we're concerned about. And just one more question. Do you anticipate, uh, you indicated that there's already debris um, coming into the detention basins. Do you anticipate cleaning those out, needing to clean those out before monsoon season? We hope to clean them out. Need, uh, I do not believe we need at this point. It's not um, a very large portion of, vol of the volume. So we have about 60 acre feet of volume, which is a tremendous amount of volume. Um, we're seeing a very small percentage of that that's being taken up by this uh, new sand, silt, ash, and debris, so uh, trees, logs, etc. cetera. Um, the nice thing about that is not only do we probably not need to clean it, but if we want to clean it, we probably can uh, see if we have internal crews that can do that instead of contracting now. So really it's going to be a question of access, um, how long that stays muddy. Um, if we are able to dry out in June, we can definitely see if we can get some crews out there with some loaders uh, and 
kind of skim off the top, if you will, get it back to where it should be uh, for monsoon season. But yeah, we'll be looking at that pretty seriously. Thank you. Council, last call. We do have a um, public commenter, Laura Kessler. Hi, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, actually, I have more questions than comments. Um, regarding what we just heard, um, I'm wondering if there's any way that, Co and I'm speaking for Coconino Estates because that's where I, I live, but of course, you know, I, I'm concerned about all the areas, but I'll just focus on Coconino Estates today. Um, so is it possible for Coconino Estates, Estates to have a temporary short-term um, mitigation. Um, I know Stefano Way has uh, Jersey barriers and they actually have a worse or had a worse situation regarding funding or uh, regarding flooding than Coconino Estates. But, um, you know, with the snowpack and the possible saturation of melted, melting snow and then back to back events, I'm just, I just want to make sure if the worst case scenario does happen like it kind of did back in. 93 and there were no burden scars at the time um, Can we get some um, something more than just individual assistance from the engineers? Uh, and I love that idea with the phone number and people coming out and helping the neighborhood Individually on an individual basis is what it sounds like, but can we do it more on a neighborhood basis? Um, and as much as I do not like Jersey barriers because they're so ugly and they kind of bring down property values, I'm sure. Um, is there something we can do that might be a little more planned than just going to each household? Now, my neighbors have made their own sandbag um, channels between the houses, but then, of course, the water's just going to go right through to the next neighborhood, Lower Coconino Estates, which is Kutch Drive, and uh, I forget the other street down there. But uh, I'm just wondering if there's a little more short-term, uh, if we could have a little more short-term uh, temporary mitigation for the entire neighborhood instead of just individually. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I, I can try to answer that. Uh, just to clarify, are you talking about Mead Lane? Yeah, I'm talking to. Okay. So, so there is an issue with Mead Lane, as as we we're probably mostly aware. That is kind of a sump condition, somewhat similar to Stavana Way. They're both sump conditions, which the sump. Uh, Scott Overton puts it way better than I do. It's the bathtub effect. I mean, it really is a low ponding area where the water collects and it takes a very long time for it to get back out of that area. Um, so for, for Mead Lane, you know, we, we can look into that. Yeah, we can, I mean, uh, we can definitely talk with our engineers, see if there isn't something that we can provide. Uh, Short-term mitigation being, you know, obviously in the line of, of more than a year. But um, yeah, we, uh, let me get back uh, to council and to the community as well. And Scott, if you want to speak to that as well, but I, I don't have a good answer for you right now on that one. Maybe Scott does, but um, uh, it's definitely something we can look into. Talkington's a little more difficult. That is more of a uh, kind of similar to what we see in Spruce Wash where it is sloped, so it is actually moving water. Um, but we can, we can look into that as well. If you don't mind, let me, let me add a, a, a finer point, and I apologize for my tardiness. I, I was in a conflicting meeting and appreciate the team being here and the residents listening to the update. Um, I, I think it's important we talk about, and, and Scott Overton for the record, I apologize, a public works director. Um, the, the question's a fair one, and I want to step back and, and talk for just a couple seconds on the modeling. And the modeling is really important because that's what informs our short-term mitigations. I, I think as a system, we have not completed the entire system. Uh, the Schultz Creek sediment basins are spectacular in the way they're gonna work and they're gonna do good things. It's imperative that we finish that system out and we've talked about that, we know that, we're pursuing that. Uh, the bathtub effect that Ed is referring to is the different type of condition than we have on the spruce wash side. So uh, the engineering team has wrestled this uh, concept and this concern from day one. Uh, that sump condition and those homes that are lower in elevation than the actual elevation of the Rio is creating that effect where the storm water is overwhelmed, it comes into that low-lying community, and then it starts to build into the community. So um, while it's counterintuitive and maybe even difficult to, 
to consider, I, I think the modeling and the engineer's work has been solid in the fact that you can protect structures and you can protect primary residences and try to do as best possible job to mitigate that, but those floodwaters will continue to fill that neighborhood, you know, in a bathtub type effect until it can find the Rio de Flag. Um, and that's why it's imperative that we get that Rio moved across 180 and across the private parcels. Um, if you were to add barrier to that equation or more sandbags, all we're really doing is displacing that impact or that pain to a neighboring property. Um, and we're going to start just filling the bathtub a little bit faster. So it's unfortunate, but the same type of mitigations really aren't as effective as they are in a flowing condition as we are seeing in the spruce wash. So the hydraulics are a little bit um, nuanced, and, and I, I think um, we've continued to advocate and be open to um, trying to understand that model and, and talking through that model. I, I am at a place where I am confident to say, as the TAC and the engineering team evaluates these models and we're finally getting really good data, even refined with mitigations, we're going to be able to share those with the public and we're going to be able to kind of put an asterisk next to it. And Ed's comments are spot on. If the basins are full and we have a compromised system, we need to take that into account. But I think our residents will understand that it's a compromised system until we can continue those mitigations. And so um, let us go back and work with the TAC and make sure we're all in agreement and the engineers are in agreement that you know, it is okay to release the models at a point certain and maybe put an asterisk right next to that conversation to say, you know, this is in the event the basins are fully functional and operational and not filled. And, uh, you know, this engaged community has been excellent about working with us and coming to our public forums and understanding the data that we're working with. And uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again, some of the smartest engineers in the Southwest are working this problem as quickly as possible. And, and I, I apologize for my long-windedness, but I, I think there are some um, opportunities for us to share data, and I think there's a learning opportunity for all of us to really understand what short-term mitigations can do and what they may actually do to harm the community even further, and that's le likely not what we want to do. So much, much different problem on Pipeline West, um, but we're moving in the right direction. I'm confident of that. Um, so we welcome the conversation. We welcome the dialogue. Um, and these are really good questions for us to take back to the TAC and work through um, because it's good feedback. Um, so keep those coming. We ask the public to keep coming, but the hydraulics are very, very different on this west side than they are in Spruce Wash. One second along these lines. Um, residents have also asked about a community meeting in the neighborhood. Do we have anything, um, any calendar dates? Yeah, so we, do, we had one, uh, I want to say, three, maybe four weeks ago now for Pipeline West. Uh, we do not have one on the books. I anticipate we will have one as the short-term mitigation group continues their work and gets their recommendations to the group in April to you all at the April work session. I would suspect you're going to see public um, communication through Sarah's office. And uh, those have included, you know, uh, community meetings and neighborhood meetings here at Chambers. And I, I would expect us to be doing the same type of activity to really disseminate the information um, as fairly and quickly as possible to a larger audience. So not scheduled, but I, I would imagine we're going to start seeing those on the books for May um, so that people can prepare for the monsoon season in July. Thank you. Yeah. Councilmember Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Scott, your division is probably the most popular, well-focused in the last six months <laughs> of any other division, so I appreciate all of your team's hard work and yours. Um, I hadn't really heard. Uh, before about this bathtub issue. Hopefully our uh, planning and zoning don't let new developments have the same effect. But um, does, is there a requirement, do you think, uh, for like uh, pumping out when it fills up like that because it has to reach up to the uh, Rio de Flag? Or will this be all mitigated once this project is complete? I mean, do we ever get away from that issue where there lower than the Rio de Flag? Yeah, excellent comments, Council Member. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll kind of take those in order if I can. One, it's a much, much bigger team than Public Works. I appreciate the comment and the support, um, but I will assure you it's private sector, it's water services, it's uh, a ton of work by a lot of folks, and we're just one small piece, but I appreciate the comment. Um, the pumping idea it was discussed early on right after the fire. Um, you know, I, I think the practicality of that became difficult. 
Uh, we've seen some residents that will build sandbags at their residence and maybe protect their primary structure and use smaller pumps to pump if water were to go beyond their sandbag walls. But on a grand scale, if you, if you think about the um, creek and the amount of water, uh, you know, physically pumping it is really pretty unrealistic in this flow setting. Um, I think our laser focus has been on completing the system and getting it across 180 and across those parcels to, um, as Kayla suggested, back to the Rio. That's where it wants to go. Um, the last point is, um, boy, I apologize, I had it too. Um, the sump pump. There was one more uh, point you made, I'm sorry. Will it all be mitigated once the project thank, is completed? Thank you, I apologize. It's a really, really important nuance. Um, the model and the really, really smart people in the room will tell you Mother Nature is undefeated. And we are designing to the biggest storm that we can fit in that makes financial sense, that makes practical sense from a physical standpoint. Um, I, I know that it could be overrun. I think we're gonna continue to message that, that there will be a storm that could overwhelm the system, but we're really trying to address the storms that are most typical that we're gonna see in the area. And then the real big wild card for us is post wildfire recovery conditions. So as that forest heals and we see good growth in the forest, that should help this equation. Um, but I, I can't with good confidence walk up here and tell you that we will mitigate our way out of every problem and uh, it would really be a, a misstatement. So we've been pretty clear about that and we'll continue to stand. We're gonna do the best work possible, but you know, in a large event, it will be overrun. Thank you. Councilmember McCarthy. Hi, Scott. Good afternoon. Did I understand you correctly saying that there's neighborhoods that are actually lower than the Rio de Flag is in their vicinity? You know, I, I uh, thank you for the question. I, I will say I, I don't remember the floor elevation of the Rio, but the neighborhoods that are adjacent to the Rio today, there's a flood map that shows them in a floodway. So the actual floor elevation, the street elevation, and the flow of the Rio, this water is coming through these neighborhood areas to get to the Rio. So clearly the bottom of the Rio, the bank, is lower than the floor elevation of a home nearby. But it's lower than the elevation of 180, it's lower than the elevation of Schultz Creek, it's getting down there, but we are still seeing that ponding condition or that bathtub effect in those low-lying areas, you know, north of Francis Short Pond all the way up to this location at the 180 crossing. So. Um, it's exact elevation. We'd have to get you that data. I know Ed can help me with that, but it, it's certainly a lower elevation, and that's why we're seeing that ponding effect um, as it gets to the Rio. So it seems if they're a little bit higher than the Rio that you would want to create a drainage path from the low-lying areas out to the Rio, but that may be difficult to do. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I think we're seeing it as it goes through properties and it sheet flows through the neighborhoods. It's finding its way to the Rio, and we see that today through small bar ditches or through private property. Um, it's not discriminating on any properties. It's simply finding its way to the Rio. The engineering team is really directing that flow across 180 and into the Rio at a point that is upstream of that location. And I, I hope that's a fair assessment and a, a simplistic example and I'm waiting for these engineers to throw something at me if I'm not getting it right. Um, so, so then after, if we get this improved to water across 180, then it won't flood these area, these low line areas. It'll, the water will... It'll reduce the risk. Yeah, it'll, okay. All right, thank you. All right, we have another public commenter, Steve Poor. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Um, great to hear some conversation about a model, okay? But i kind of surprised to think that uh, the citizens aren't smart enough to figure out what the range of outcomes could be. They, uh, they live through what God gave us. They know the probabilities are unpredictable. Just give us the information. And when Ed says it's last year's model, Last year's model didn't have the walls we built. Last year's model didn't even have the, they had water going from Savannah through the backyard of our south neighbors. That doesn't happen. That needs to be changed. 
through, before the model was done, they talked about putting in the barriers where they eventually did uh, at the apartments, okay? But they didn't run it all the way down the channel till halfway through the season. Two or three, I forget where it was, how they adjusted how things were gonna be. And, and lastly, Ed's part of a conversation about how were they gonna replace what little channel we put on Savannah Way by our own neighbors in the fire department to get the water off our street. And there's been an agreement, I understand, that Ed's been a part of the conversation, that there's going to be a bigger channel put in there. Why doesn't he put that in a model and share that with us? Why didn't we hear about it? I mean, is the water, is it going to be done or not? Ed? Thanks, Steve. Uh, we are still under property negotiations with that property owner um, for the ditch, if you want to call it that, uh, through Stavana Way. So there's nothing that we can publicly provide at this time, um, but we are working with our engineering team on that as well as with real estate here in the city um, to get that property uh, acknowledgement for the, if you want to call it a ditch, the ditch that will go through Stavana Way. Uh, that would mostly follow the same footprint of that temporary ditch that was uh, dug by the neighbors during the flood event. So uh, we're still working on that in the background, uh, but until we have more to share, we, we haven't shared that publicly. Uh, good, good points uh, made on the, the walls have been made or built uh, since that 2022 model. Uh, we do have various, various revisions of the 2022 model, so we do have models that show uh, the, you know, the walls and the short-term mitigations, et cetera. Um, so got plenty there to work with. And again, we'll work with our TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee, on, um, you know, what is shared. So I'll be working with Scott and many others on, on that. So um, feel free. I'll, I'm here for more questions or anything else. Thanks. And you get the sense that the public would like the modeling sooner rather than later. You feel the, the um, urgency? Oh, definitely. I, and I know that urgency very well. Um, I am not a team of one, so that is definitely something that we'll work through our focus group on. So uh, I do not make any decisions unilaterally, but we'll work on that. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we are going to move on to item number nine, American Rescue Plan Act. Funds Supporting the Local Economy. Thanks. Thank you, Ed, et al. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Heidi Hansen, Interim Deputy City Manager. I'm gonna let John pop that presentation up, but I'm, I'm just gonna get us started. Um, so this afternoon, you're going to hear, be hearing about the great work that Discover Flagstaff and Choose Flagstaff teams did to coordinate with our amazing grants team to serve our tourism and small business partners with two grant programs supported with ARPA funding. But first, I wanted to provide some background again to you on how we got to this point today. During our past ARPA funding conversations, I, after collaboration with staff and several partners, Council Member Sweet, our former Council Member Salas, who had big interest in helping our businesses, requested that we set aside ARPA money for a grant program that we would call Small Business Grant Program 2.0. Our city budget team agreed that this program could be brought forward to the Council for consideration. So part of the consideration was sharing the background of how we had already done a similar program, which we called Small Business Grant Program 1.0. In early September of 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Downtown Business Alliance Director, Terry Modeska, she approached the City of Flagstaff, the County, and NAU about a possible partnership to offer grants to help small businesses that were impacted by the pandemic. It was agreed that all three organizations would offer $10,000 toward a micro-grant program that was implemented in November 2020. 
In summary, the program allocated 24 grant, grants where the grant amounts range from $750 to $3,000. The Downtown Business Alliance helped administer the program, and I will tell you, taking no administration fee, but instead offering the entire 100% of the funds to our small businesses. Since this grant program was such a success, we then decided to come back and do the Small Business Grant Program 2.0. At the time of our council ARPA discussions, we had reached out to the county to see if they could partner with us in matching our initial request, which was $500,000, to go to our tourism and small business partners. The idea that we had was to have $1 million of ARPA funding circulated to our business community. The county was not able to participate with us. At the time, they shared that they did not have their ARPA funding decided on. So we moved forward as the city um, on our own, and these are the following allocations that this uh, past city council had offered. 150,000 toward tourism grants and 300,000 for small business grants. So 450,000, close to the 500,000 that we were hoping for. So I stand here today to thank our past and present council and staff for their great work in getting these funds out to our business community. They so desperately need this money, and we can't thank you enough. But I'm not gonna steal the thunder of Trace Ward, our Discover Flagstaff Director, or John Saltonstall, our business, retention and re our business Expansion and Retention Manager. They're going to give you the details. I just wanted to provide the background. Again, thank you for caring so much about this community. I think you're gonna be excited about what you see. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, Trace Ward, Discover Flagstaff Director. Thanks for having us today. So as Heidi said, uh, we're here today to, to give you an update on the ARPA funds, which Council granted uh, in my case, and then John will speak to, the tourism-related businesses uh, here in Flagstaff. So as Heidi said, uh, 150,000 was allocated to travel, tourism, and hospitality, and another 300,000 to small business relief. Um, so the notice of funding available was sent out to the tourism partners in August of 2022, late August of 2022. Um, all tourism-related businesses, it was sent out to all tourism-related businesses that fit under one of these seven categories. Um, we also had procurement run an ad in the Arizona Daily Sun uh, so we can reach all intended audience uh, as, as efficiently as possible. And that ad had a link taking them back to the notice of available funding as well. So just kind of a little uh, to the left is what that notice of funding uh, cover page looked like. So... Uh, this is just a quick collage of some of the partners, the happy partners who received this and, and we're thankful. We had 23 partners apply uh, from the tourism sector and um, we were hoping for a few more but we'll take the 23 um, and 20, all 23 were granted funding. So this again is just a collage of some of them uh, who received funding. Um, I have a few quotes which I thought would be apropos in sharing with you, so in the words of these individuals, if you don't mind, um, the grant that we got from you is already providing to be wonderful. There are uh, back-end issues with our website and search engines and marketing to sell tickets for our shows that have been on my back burner for four years. I have been able to hire a new guy to start fixing them. It's wonderful to have that finally being done, plus we're able to actually spend a little bit of money, cash, for advertising, which is great to thank you. That's Chris Virrell with, uh, he's the executive director of Theatricos. Just a couple more. Uh, we have, we greatly appreciate working with Discover Flagstaff. The funds have been enormous uh, have been an enormous help for our business. Thank you. And that's Kim Davis, the owner of the 303 B&B here in Flagstaff. 
And um, of course, one more before I turn it over to John, questions and then turn it over to John. Just wanted to let you, you all know how appreciative I am and how helpful the ARPA funds have been, uh, to, uh, have been and continue to be for our business. With gratitude, Scott McClelland, he's the owner of Tiki Grill, which has delicious hamburgers. Yes, they do, so please go check out Tiki Grill. It is a new business in town. Uh, any questions for me? Mine's short and sweet, and then I'll turn it over to John. I have a question that you might not be able to answer. Okay. So those are the best kind, right? Yes. Um, do you remember how much money was given to, and Rebecca may still be on the line, was given to event promoters uh, at, in terms of waiving fees for events? Yeah, so from this point, Oh, sorry, Rebecca, did you want to answer that? Oh, I thought I heard something. At any rate, um, from this particular funding, the event promoters were not part of uh, the seven in the category, although I will tell you that we, in our base budget and in the, uh, the asks that we have every year, we do promote uh, the events in town. So we do that in, in our normal line of work. Uh, every year, which has helped help them with their marketing side of it. Um, in terms of pros, I couldn't answer that for you. I'm just thinking that that money is actually part of this bigger picture that we're talking about in terms of local businesses helping those events to um, waiving the fees and whatnot. But I do not see Rebecca, and I told you you might not be able to answer this question because it's not related to this. Oh. I can. Hi, Stacy Brecknice, Grants, Contracts, Emergency Management Director. Um, our office actually administers the um, ARPA funds, as you know, on behalf of the city um, with um, all the divisions. And the answer to your question is 85000 um, pretty close to that amount. And I think, and um, she was right, we spent a pretty good amount, um, probably uh, half, but um, this grant goes for four years. We have until 2024 to expend the funds, so we've got time for those, um, you know, to be spent down. So hopefully that answered your question. Yes, thank you. And Come. Rebecca, do you have anything to add? I think Stacy probably covered it better than I did. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council, I'm John Saltonstall, Business Retention and Expansion Manager for the City of Flagstaff, here to talk about the $300,000 that went to the Small Business Relief. Um, these are the rules of the program, essentially. We said we were going to prioritize businesses that had not received any prior COVID funding relief at all. That did not mean that anyone who received prior funding was ineligible. It simply meant that we were gonna prioritize those who had not received any. Um, we wanted to target the small businesses, so we gave this provision of having 50 um, full-time equivalents or less. Um, we started out saying we were gonna just focus on businesses within the city limits, and immediately after the announcement of this notice uh, of funding availability that occurred on December 14th. We heard from a lot of businesses who said, hey, we were in the city limits, uh, things got tough, we're working out of our home, we're still in business, but we're no longer in there. So we ultimately changed that on the fly to allow any business within the FMPO, the Flagstaff Metropolitan Planning Organization boundary, uh, I've got a map of it here in just a moment, uh, to participate. And then also in terms of containment, we wanted to make sure the awards were significant but not overwhelming to us uh, from a management perspective. So we had awards between $5,000 and $20,000. So this is the map of the 525 square miles that makes up the FMPO boundary. You can see it, in, it covers everyone we think of when we think of Flagstaff, or many. So that's the boundary. And so the summary, uh, we had the, we notified as many folks as we could. We had it on the economic development webpage known as Choose Flagstaff. 
we had the full application on the city of Flagstaff official website. Uh, we were working with the chamber, with ECONA, uh, with the DBA, with anyone who would have us. We got on the radio. I spoke my cell phone number on the radio to say, anyone who has any question, call me directly. Um, and what's that? Uh, I didn't, I thought this is not a good idea, but I, um, nonetheless, that's what I did. And it resulted with 105 applications um, and 42 were being, w will be awarded. Um, that's what that amounts to. And here's a map of all of the people who took advantage of the program. Um, Hopefully you can see it a little better on, in, the, in your pamphlet there, but you can see that they're all over, um, mostly in the city limits, but many are outside, and we thought that was pretty positive. So here are the numbers. The total dollars requested, one point, let's just call it 1.8 million. Uh, total proposed match dollars, 4.6. There were the 61 businesses that were previously awarded with some COVID relief funding, they received 6.5 million already. So there's already been some dollar, uh, some dollars coming to the assistance of our small businesses, but you can see by the match or by the requested amount, there's a lot of need there still. Um, and right now we are working as a, a feverish team, frankly, to get these 42 contracts out to those businesses that have been awarded. And uh, here are just a number of thanks. I won't read them all, but many of the businesses have been super grateful just for the opportunity. I mean, even the businesses that weren't awarded said, thank you for doing this. We are so appreciative. Uh, they know that they couldn't, there wasn't enough to fund everybody, but they said thanks nonetheless. So um, I'm passing that thanks on to you and to the former council as well. So thank you. The businesses are super grateful and Hopefully, we'll be seeing good things. Thank you. That's all we have. Will, will we ever know who the businesses are, or is that information that's not going to be shared publicly? Well, it is all public information, and we can certainly, we have not, I have not done one yet. I'm not sure if Trace did, but we could certainly do a press release about all yeah. of that information. I think that would be a great thing to do because it's, it's a positive story. Great. Thank you. Um, questions, comments? Councilmember Sweet. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to do a brief thank you to Discover Flag staff, our grants team, to staff in general, to the previous council. Our small business community remains pretty fragile right now, and without your help, uh, we wouldn't have what makes Flag staff, what I believe anyway, unique, special, and a place we all want to be. So thank you very much for all of your hard work. Ditto. Yeah, very well said, Councilmember Sweet. Um, thank you very much. All right, we are moving down to item number 10, City of Flagstaff Hazardous Materials Response and Planning Presentation. And I just want to share my gratitude for um, jumping on this so quickly and, and getting this presentation to us. There have been so many questions uh, about the train derailment, you know, in Ohio and um, people wanting to know what our plans are. So I appreciate how quickly this has come to us. Right, yes, absolutely. Um, good afternoon, council uh, members, mayor and vice mayor. My name is Chris Fennell. I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations for the Flagstaff Fire Department. And as I can imagine, there's probably a lot of fire departments doing the same presentation for cities and areas where there's a train track that runs through it. So we appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to you about this today. Um, some of the introductions that I have, our team that we have here, we have Battalion Chief Dave Wilson. He's gonna be our primary presenter. He's run our hazardous materials and special operations team for a long time, so he's a great guy to have. We've got Keith Cachette. He's one of our captains at the fire department, and he's also our resident expert with the hazardous materials stuff, so great resource. And then we've got emergency management with us also. Uh, we have Stacy BK, which you all know, and then Daniel Kelly. He's joined the team recently, and he's hit the ground running and done a great job with everything, so... 
Um, yeah, after the presentation that we have, if you want to take a quick recess, we do have our hazmat truck that's outside in the parking lot. If you want to come out and kind of look at the equipment and see what that's all about um, to match up those capabilities. So with that, I'll turn this over to Dave. Good evening. Like Chris said, my name is Dave Wilson. I'm the A-Shift Battalion Chief, but I've also been over the Special Operations Program for the past eight years. Uh, been involved with the program a few years longer, but... All right. Yeah, slide Jay, thank you. That's why I don't, I don't touch these very much, so I'll try to communicate what I, what I want. There you go, perfect. All right, so little history on the Flagstaff or on the Special Operations Program in the Flagstaff Fire Department. Um, we'll start with uh, just kind of a little background, what we do, how many people we have. All of our members that are on the, the fire department are all trained in a basic hazardous materials um, class. So all of our members, every one of them that are out there, have a basic knowledge of hazardous materials. Um, on the team itself, our Special Operations team, we have 18 dual certified techs. We've got them split up. We're, we're split up in A, B, and C shifts. So there's six techs on each shift. Um, just for coverage, that way if anything occurs on any given day, um, we have techs that are on duty that can help manage that situation. Um, all of our techs go through, when I, when I call them our techs, they've gone through hazardous materials responder. Um, which is a 200-hour, five-week class, and they're also technical rescue technicians, which is another 200-hour, five-week class. Um, so everybody that's part of the program has gone through those two classes, a lot of training, and then every year they have to maintain that training as they go forward. Um, so right now, our special operations program is set up between Stations 5, which is out on 180 in the Fort Valley area, um, and then Station 2, which is the, the station right in the middle of town, um, on Ponderosa Parkway, the road that goes up to the Catholic Church. That's the, the two stations where we have our special operations stations. Um, at each station, Station 5 houses the hazmat truck, and Station 2 houses what we call our squad. It's a heavy rescue truck. Um, the, the, uh, every day, those companies respond to all the other calls that we have on a daily basis, along with the hazardous material um, response that they do. They consist of, on, on the different trucks, they have tools to handle, if it's rope rescue, water rescue, confined space, um, trench rescue, short haul, that's hanging from the helicopter, there's a picture of that. So they cover a wide variety of responsibilities, not only just the hazardous material side of things. Okay, so the program has been around for years. After September 11th, the, the, it drastically changed what, our, what equipment we had in the city. Um, right before September 11th, we were awarded this hazmat truck. We had got that. That was a great state-funded grant that we got the new hazmat truck. After September 11th, we got the heavy rescue. Um, it also included a whole bunch of equipment. The truck was fully staffed, loaded up, so that it could look just like um, across the state. I believe there were seven or eight other identical trucks in case something drastic, tragic happened that we could respond and all the trucks look very similar and the different companies, the different um, cities could go to that truck and know where stuff was and handle it exactly like. Um, so that changed the equipment that we had here in the city along with the, the personnel that we had because um, we got a lot more training that was, that was federally funded for that. Um, since then, as everybody knows, a lot of the grant funding has dried up for the, for the special operations programs. The, the threats have gone down, but here in the city of Flagstaff, we still have constant threats with the railroad, the highways, um, and all of the other fixed sites that we have in the, in the city. Um, while many of the other departments around the state have started to lessen what they can and, and can do, some of, the, some of the hazmat programs are going away, here in the city we've maintain that we're keeping our hazardous materials special operations team. Um, what we've had to do is we've restructured our trucks a little bit. At, at the time when we got the heavy rescue, it came with all new hazmat equipment and rope rescue equipment. Since then, we've split those up. The squad has the rope rescue equipment. The hazmat truck has all the, the hazmat equipment um, that are on, on the different vehicles. Um, 
So here in the city, we respond to hazmat calls on a daily basis. It could be a natural gas leak, um, uh, and we this of sol solids, liquids, gases, um, but we, we have hazardous material calls that we run on every, every day in the city. Natural gas is one of the most common. Everybody that smells natural gas, it comes. It's a, gaseous, uh, it's a gas that, that people know it's, it's smelly, so they don't know where it's coming from. So those stations, Station 5 and Station 2, respond to all of those natural gas leak calls because they have meters on their trucks to handle those calls. So we go back to Station 2, Station 2 being one of our busiest stations, not one of our, the busiest station in the, in the city, um, we add that onto them. So it's, it's a taxing job being at Station 2 as far as just all of the stuff that they have to do on a daily basis. Um, again, we, we hit some of the fixed sites that we have across. We've got Gore, NAU, the wastewater and the water treatment plants, um, and there's Gas Farm out in Winona and Purina. Those are all sites that on a daily basis have hazardous materials on them, not only the, the rail and the highway. Um, but I know everybody wants to talk about the rail and the, and the emergency response. Um, a, a couple of pictures up there, the, the truck on the left has all kinds of placards on it. Um, and that's the, it's the, the BNSF, um, there's some apps that we have. It's, it's called Ask Rail, which will give us up-to-date information on what's coming through town. Um, this, kind of the scary thing about the truck is we never know what's going through town. It's one of those things that until something happens, then we have to try to figure it out. Um, so, but those are on a daily basis. We have these hazards rolling through town. Um, so just kind of a little idea of what we would do on a, on a, if it was an emergency scene, if we had some kind of an, and what I've done is we've set up that if we had a, a rail car that had a two inch ga gouge, excuse me, in it leaking chlorine. Um, and in a couple slides, you'll see a plume and kind of a slide going through downtown Flagstaff looking like if that was it. So it's a two inch gouge with chlorine that would be leaking out of it. Um, what our response would be on a daily basis, um, it would come in and we'd have, it would get upgraded because it's a hazardous materials um, response and we'd have six different units there plus two battalion chiefs on scene. The hazardous materials team would respond to this assignment. Um, initiate incident command and then just like any of our other calls that we go on, be it fire, uh, car accidents or whatever, it's life safety, it's an acronym of LIPS that we use, the Life Safety Incident Stabilization Property, Environmental Conservation, and Scene Stabilization. Those are our priorities when we get on scene. Um, the rail car emergency in the middle of town, not, it's not changing. That's our, our same response that what we're going to do. Um, every fire truck in the city has this book right here. It's called our, it's our Emergency Response Guide. Um, excuse me. So every fire truck has this. It has the initial if you can find out exactly what it is. And the thing about the trains, um, if you notice, they're all placarded. It tells you what's on those, on those cars. Um, again, the trucks are placarded as well, um, but it's always not as easily to identify what's inside. So the, the trains have placards telling us what it is. So those initial companies on scene can identify what the hazard is that's leaking, and then we can set up a plan. This book, which is a, it's called our emergency response guide, will give us that basic outline of, hey, I need you to evacuate this amount of, of area. This, and it just gives us the basics on where to start. Um, and then we would get everybody involved uh, <laughs> as far as the EOC, the, of course, PD would be involved with help with evac evacuation, and it would escalate very quickly um, from there. Um, so this shows that modeling that I talked about of the, of the chlorine leak. In the middle of town, this is, I, and it's hard to see, I apologize, it's downtown Flagstaff. Um, the wind predominantly blows out of the southwest in Flagstaff, so that plume model is what you're looking at of where it, ma the majority of the leak would go towards. Um, we have, on the hazardous material truck, we use an a, a app called Cameo, and what it does is it, it, we can break us down and, and come up with some modeling and different ideas on what it's going to look like, what we need to prepare for, and where we need to go from there. Um, we can also use the National Weather Service in Belmont to give us that modeling as well. And right here, I'll kind of step back. Daniel is going to jump in here and just talk about the emergency management side of things as well. Thank you, Chief. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council members, uh, thank you. And it's an honor to be here tonight. 
So, uh, like the chief said, emergency management, we would already be responding to the scene, uh, part of the incident command. Um, simultaneously, we'd be notifying city PIO, uh, Sarah in her office, and the um, city manager's office of the ongoing situation uh, to provide uh, situational updates. Uh, for this given scenario, uh, Cameo, so Cameo is the computer-aided management of emergency operations. It was developed by EPA and NOAA back in the late 1980s, if I remember correctly. It is a fantastic program, and it, uh, it, gives, uh, it assists the frontline chemical emergency responders on how to deal with the uh, problem. So as you see right here, the plume, this is a prediction plume, and the different colors represent the different density. The, obviously, the darker the density, the worse it is, so worst case. And then the outer boundary is the uh, weather, uh, the wind prediction line. And during this, and based off this model, emergency management, we've been working with uh, Flagstaff PD, Flagstaff Fire, and um, the city PIO regarding uh, evacuations and uh, protective measures that need to be taken. Uh, we would also be working with county emergency management uh, and requesting them to work with the Red Cross uh, and to spin up the EOC. And one other thing is we would also be getting the ADEQ, the state of Arizona would get involved um, in any kind of a hazardous materials uh, incident like this. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of give a rundown of these are the basic things that we would do on any kind of a hazardous materials leak um, like this in the, in the middle of the city of Flagstaff. Uh, it's one of those, something like this is going to um, be overwhelming no matter who's there and responding. But what it is, is it gives us a great base and a great start of where to go from there. Um, we talked about the railroad and I think uh, the railroad, BNSF runs through uh, the, the city and they themselves are a huge tool that we would would use and be part of. Um, the one thing that the railroad has is emergency response teams of their, of their own that are situated throughout the Southwest to respond very quickly to any kind of an emergency. So um, we reached out to BNSF. I would have loved to have them here, but unfortunately they weren't able to make it. Um, but they are in, them, in themselves a huge tool that we would use to help try to mitigate this, not help, but they would be doing most of the mitigation from moving forward. Um, the thing about hazardous materials, most of the time, it's a private company that's moving it through town. So when we have the leak and we try to get the initial um, stop, the leak stopped, we try to do whatever we can to mitigate the situation. The cleanup, the, the, af the days after of what's going up, that falls back on the private company to come in and try to manage the cleanup. The, the, um, it, we go back to the, the scene in the, in the Midwest. Those were private companies that came in to try to mitigate the situation as best they could. Um, and so that's where it takes everybody on a hazardous materials situation. Um, but with the city, we have a really good um, starting point. And um, yeah, our team's really, I, I'm proud of the team. And so I have confidence in, in their abilities and what we would be able to do in the city. Um, so, um, kind of just in review, um, just talk about what, you know, all the coordinated efforts that would go on between the city, uh, the county, the, uh, the private companies, BNSF, or whatever company it was that would have a leak. Um, we have a strong, healthy hazardous material program. Um, and uh, what we've learned over the last couple of years um, with the different fires, the, whatever the emergency scene is, when it's a large scene, it takes the whole greater Flagstaff region. Um, and, and so that's one really good area that we're at. We all work together splendid now um, as we move forward. So it would take the whole region um, to handle these types of calls. So that hopefully will kind of help you get an idea, a little understanding. I'm not the, the public speaker. They kind of drug me in off the truck. So I apologize if I'm rambling. But if you have any questions or anything like that, shoot them at us. Councilmember Matthews and then Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two questions. Um, our techs go through, you said, you know, several hours of training every year. Where is that done? Is that local or do they have to go somewhere else? So 
all of the training is done in the state. Um, it, we were fortunate, so we had a hazmat class, a 200-hour hazardous materials class that just ended, just what? February. February. So we had it here in Flagstaff, um, which took, it was an effort to get it up here, and of course it was right in the middle of one of the snowiest winters, and so it was interesting. But they take place all throughout the state, and basically you request, um, you send in a request to the state um, to have that class, to have that training, and then it could take place anywhere in the state of Arizona, but they're all done in the state of Arizona. The TRT, the Technical Rescue Technician, there's a couple places that do it. Phoenix does it. The city of Phoenix puts on a technical rescue training um, class. Also, Prescott does it. Prescott has a, uh, uh, a class that they put on. Um, so those are a little more specific and on who puts them on, but they're all in the state of Arizona. Thank you, and my other question is, is there any uh, hazardous materials or chemicals that are not allowed to run through our railroad here but are allowed in other states or other regions? You know, I might fall back on Keith on that one. Um, there are some chemicals that you can't ship over the rail, um, but predominantly um, there's no limitations on what they can ship um, in regards to I know for like over the highway, we have a city ordinance that doesn't allow like radiation to park, you know, they have to move through. They can travel through the therapy, but they can't actually like park at Little America, for example. Um, that was years ago that, that was passed. So there's those parameters, but um, in large, most of the chemicals, um, they can ship them through Flagstaff at any given time. And they do come through at any given time. BNSF ships about 80 to 100 uh, trains in a 24 hour period that come through Flagstaff. Predominantly, the chemicals that come through Flexstaff are flammable and combustible liquids, so diesel, kerosene, Jet A, different alcohols and solvents. That's the vast majority of it um, is going to be your flammable and combustible liquids. I can get you a report. BNSF sends us a report every year, and it tells us the exact quantities and what was shipped through your community. Thank you, Keith. Vice Mayor? Um, I was, I, just as a piggyback, I was curious about uranium, uh, it, uh, and I saw Stacy BK was about ready to say something too, so feel free to jump in. But my, <clears throat> I'll ask my question, then you guys can tag team these uh, thoughts however you want. Uh, my mind drifted towards Red Gap Ranch as we were having this conversation. Uh, the city of Flagstaff does own certain portions of Red Gap Ranch. Uh, wondering if you can speak to the protocol for getting help way out there if something happens uh, along the highway or along the railway uh, outside of town even, uh, but over there where we have a substantial interest in uh, hazardous materials management um, and land uh, that we own out there. Sure, so let me go back to after September 11th when they awarded these trucks to the different areas, they were regionally, um, they, they designated regional areas that they wanted to respond. So at the time, we were the Northern Arizona response team to handle all of Northern Arizona. Now, we still are the Northern Arizona response team. So if it's in Northern Arizona, and that's w one of the great things that our administration has backed us 100%, we're still gonna respond when the community around the city of Flagstaff needs our help because we have the tools, we have the training, and we have the equipment. Um, so we still respond regionally to the Northern parts of Arizona. Um, if there's an emergency down in the southern Arizona and it takes the state, by all means, we would respond down there and we would ask for help from them as well. So hopefully that answers your question. It's a nice umbrella answer uh, yeah. that covers what I said. And I will note that I uh, invoked the term Red Gap Ranch and our city attorney appeared uh, very magically. Um, <laughs> uh, that's just a joke. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so what is the radius does that go all the way to the New Mexico border and all the way out to Kingman and uh, we have we have responded all the way to the northern parts of Arizona we've responded out east on I-40 all the way close to the New Mexico border um, so yes we when we say we're going to be that regional response we have responded out there um, when needed understood any other questions Councilmember McCarthy thank you mayor what tends to cause these problems? Is it fires or cars parked on the railroad? 
or derail, derailments, or uh, is there kind of a general trend of where these problems uh, originate? Are in just to, so I just want to clarify: Are you just talking about like a hazardous materials incident, um, or derailments, or what specifically are you the problems? Well, uh, hazardous waste mm -hmm. uh, being hazardous materials being released to the environment. And so I guess my question is, you know, is that because commonly is it a, a derailment or, a, you know, maybe a car parked on the, the railroad tracks which causes a derailment or it might just be lack of maintenance on the tracks or it might be a fire out at Perina or whatever. Sure. So, so or is it just everything and it can be anything, I guess. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the beauty of our job. You never know what it's going to be on a daily basis. Um, I, I can't say that there's any um, consistent, well, let me start with the train. We've had derailments throughout my career here in the last 24 years. We've had derailments, a handful of derailments in and around the city. Um, but it's not anything that, that is a consistent thing. And I know that BNSF has put millions of dollars into their rail and how they have actual heat monitors on their rails um, to find out if cars are over, overheating or if the brakes are overheating. Um, so derailment concerns, it's a, it's a possibility, um, but it's not something that we see often at all. If I would say, going back to, we have the natural gas leaks, those are the, the most common. The other most common nat or hazmats that we would, incidents that we would find are on the highway um, between a semi that jackknifes or crashes or, or whatever it has. Those are the most common incidents that we have as far as uh, if we were going to have some kind of hazardous materials and have some kind of a, a leak or anything like that. And it could be diesel that we're, that's uh, leaking out of the saddle the tanks, the saddle tanks, um, into the ground. So those are the most common that we see. Um, as far as trains, it's not a common uh, occurrence for them to have a derailment. Um, there's been a couple, I think, what, um, two weeks ago they had a a brake fire on a, uh, a train that was east of town that Summit Fire Department handled. Um, so it's, it's few and far between that we see with the trains, but the, the vehicle accidents on the freeway, that's a common occurrence. Thank you. I have a couple um, questions. <laughs> oh, did you want to? Okay. Um, didn't I read or someone tell me that BNSF has an app that you all have um, that tells what is, what is going to be coming through on the rails? So it's an app called Ask Rail that, all it, that BNSF sends out to all first responders so that they can have. So what it does is, is when that train goes through town, it will tell us exactly what's on the train, how much is on the train, um, and all the pertinent information that we would need because in years past we would always have to find the conductor who had a the, the manifest of what was on the train so yes there is an app that we have on our phones um, that gives us that information thank you and who is responsible for enforcing the cleanup if it comes to that it's a big event and whichever company is responsible for cleanup, who enforces that? Well, that would, it would come back to, because when I, we say we report it to the ADEQ, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, they would be the ones that would enforce that. And if anybody has anything to add on that, um, they would be the ones that would enforce that, uh, the cleanup part of that. Thank you. And that's it. Stacy, please. <laughs> no. No, I, I just wanted to uh, say a few words. It was nice. To, um, Daniel was able to get up here. You haven't met him yet. We'll, we'll bring him back, but he's our new emergency manager um, and um, has a lot of experience, came from emergency management in Tennessee. So we're happy to have him here. Um, uh, one of the first meetings that we did set up with external meet and greet um, with emergency ma city emergency management was BNSF. And I want to assure you that our meeting we had with the HAZMAT director for the region 
um, was excellent. Uh, they will bring amazing resources, all the stuff that they have to bring to a rail uh, derailment or a hazardous um, substance uh, incidents. It was amazing and he had nothing higher to say but our hazmat team at the city um, spoke highly of it. So um, I think um, between BNSF and our city hazmat team, we, we really have a good partnership um, and now with uh, city emergency management in the county. So thanks, that was it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was wonderful and exactly what I was hoping for. So thank you. And um, before we do our field trip, since we are right at the end of our meeting, I'd like to just finish up and then staff can go home if they want to um, and we can make you stay and let us look at your truck um, all night. You know, we'll have, we'll have the rest of the evening. Um, so we have no public participation. Oh, we do. Mayor, I'm sorry, I just had somebody jump online. Apologies for the interruption. Oh, no, no worries. Let's have public participation. Great. Mayor, I have Anthony Garcia. Anthony, if you would like to go ahead and unmute, you can offer your comments now. Okay, um, sorry about that, guys. Hopefully I can get through this really quick. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Aslan, Honorable Council, I'm Anthony Garcia, 2212 North Center Street, Flagstaff, Arizona. On behalf of the Sunnyside community, I wanted to express my delight and deepest gratitude towards Team Flagstaff for their participation at the Sunnyside Neighborhood Association's monthly meeting this March. At this meeting, City Manager Clifton, alongside Scott Overton, Public Works, Rebecca Sayers and Amy Hagen, Parks and Rec, presented two separate, highly anticipated and very exciting community investment opportunities for the sunny side. Rebecca and, and Amy shared steps forward and a tentative timeline for Ponderosa Park improvements. Sunnyside neighbors conveyed the importance of the community input on the park and a desire to assist in the outreach. But since there is a clear plan forward and funding and um, a successful um, plan in place for that project, I'll be focusing the rest of my comments on um, the project that uh, Scott shared with us, um, with the neighbors at that meeting. So let's talk about old fire station number two. You know that old fire station that's kind of adjacent there to uh, Joel Montavo baseball field, currently used as storage, I believe, for the city. Well, once upon a time, um, a previous council and potentially a mayor um, had prioritized, uh, you know, redeveloping that fire station for the use uh, to serve the Sunnyside neighborhood and moreover the city's youth by redeveloping it into a STEM um, or a STEAM research facility. Um, they did that by adding money to a budget for a conceptual plan and architectural design and a visioning for that old fire station. Well, at that meeting, Scott um, shared with us the initial uh, tentative blueprints that was tentatively titled Joel Montavo STEAM Learning Center. Um, he, he shared that with the Sunnyside Neighborhood Association and, and everybody in that meeting was really upbeat about this project. So um, uh, over the next seven weeks, myself and my friends will be um, providing public comment supporting the redevelopment of old fire station number two and you know testimony on the importance of community investment within the Sunnyside neighborhood. Um, we They had funding for the initial um, concept design, um, but we'll be having needing to work together with council uh, in the very near future in order to make this project a success. Thank you guys. Thank you, Anthony. Any additional public participation? All right, we'll move on. Item number 12, informational items, two from Mayor, Council, and City Manager, future agenda item requests. Let's start with Council Member McCarthy. Nothing tonight, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Sweet. Thank you, Mayor. I hope to see everyone this Saturday for the Viola Awards. Excited for that. And I do have an update from NAU. Tomorrow is the NAU Giving Day. It's where we celebrate what makes our community extraordinary. 
dollars raised on Giving Day directly fund scholarships, student programs, and sustainability efforts and basic needs such as food, shelter, and expanded access to childcare and student parents. As part of Giving Day, our Lumberjacks are also giving back to the community through their third annual Student Org Service Day. To learn more, you can go to givingday.foundationnau.org. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Council Member Harris? Uh, yes, I just want us to think about a, a future item. Um, I'm curious as to whether our commissions uh, are aware of all of the plans that we have adopted and in the process of creating their own strategic plans that those plans are being vetted against or alongside um, all the plans that we've adopted. Am I making sense? Does that request sound? It makes sense to me, S city manager, does you got that? Yeah. Yes, I think we got notes on that uh, and thank you very much, council member. Thank, thank you. you. Anything else, council member Harris? No. <laughs> council member Matthews? I don't have anything at this time, thank you. Thank you. I just have a couple quick things. Yesterday, I went to NA, the op um, grand opening of NAU's Early Education, Early Learning Center, which is uh, a phenomenal resource for currently for NAU students to, um, to access childcare. And I think their plans are eventually to have it open to NAU staff. Um, as well and it was just a fun grand opening and um, I'm excited for them to have this resource in town and today I was able to attend my first Commission on Inclusion and Adaptive Living they meet on Tuesdays and we're trying to get that date changed um, so that council members can uh, attend those meetings but one thing that was brought up is the need for additional community education about sidewalks and um, people of, of different abilities being able to access sidewalks, whether it's garbage cans, vehicles parked on sidewalks, snow on sidewalks, whatever. Um, just a, a lot of concern was, was expressed and I told them that's right up my alley and I look forward to working on on that, and that is all I have. We're adjourned. There's every year. These five million guests make tourism the largest industry in the city of Flagstaff and is arguably the most important economic engine positively impacting the quality of life for Flagstaff citizens. In the 1980s, much like many other destinations did during this time or even earlier, the city of Flagstaff voted to impose a tax that would primarily burden the visitor in an effort to repurpose these monies to beautify the city, attract new businesses, and inspire additional visitation. In large part, a distinct benefit of the tax is that it is levied on goods and services frequently purchased by visitors. In the spirit of the tax and its intended use, it is vital that monies collected funnel back into supporting the development of a business and a tourist-friendly environment. 1988 was a monumental year for the country, state, and Flagstaff. 1988. The BBB tax was adopted by the voters for a 10-year period. A 2% levy on the gross sales of revenue generated from hotels, motels, campgrounds, bars, and restaurants, and is in addition to all other taxes. Here is what the allocation looked like at that time. 1996. BBB tax was renewed for a 15-year period and allocation changed. The tourism budget was cut 18.5%, as well as cuts were made to economic development and beautification, while Parks and Recreation was added as a newly funded BBB department receiving the largest percentage of the collected tax monies. 2010 BBB tax was renewed a second